thank you uh, for coming and uh, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to uh, start uh, off this conference with a tutorial on directed topology. Um, I've been to several GetCo conferences and uh, it has always been my nice uh, colleagues, uh, Martin, uh, Lisbeth or Eric, uh, giving the, uh, this type of tutorial. So I'm, I'm very happy to uh, be allowed to step in. So um, what I want to uh, tell you is um, what we call, or what people call the geometric semantics of programs. So this is what we are going to start with. Afterwards, I will go into the combinatorial model and uh, time permitting, I will talk a bit about what we can actually use geometry and topology for, for computing invariance of, uh, of programs. So let's start. Um, so um, the algebraic view on programs, this is not the geometric view, this is the algebraic view and uh, this is not very good. Thank you, uh, Georg, for giving me signs. Um, so uh, a program, what is a program? A program is a sequence of instructions. Um, what you see here on the right is a scratch program, uh, the first programming languages that kids in France learn in school. Um, scratch is nice, but at some point you will want to do other things. But in any case, um, a program is very simple, right? It's a sequence of instructions, and then there might be some branching and some loops, and that's basically it. Um, there is nothing more to programming. Uh, this is why you can teach it to, to kids um, in fourth grade. Um, so uh, if you take the algebraic point of view, it means that a program concept well, a, a programming languages has has a set uh, of instruction and some in, some operations on those instructions. So there is concatenation of instruction, there is choice between instructions, there is repetition repetition. So, so the algebraic structure you get is an idempotent semi-ring with a, a unary uh, star which computes fixed points. And um, let me just go on uh, because I'm not taking the algebraic view here, I'm taking the geometric, the, the geometric view. Uh, so geometrically, a problem is also a sequence of instructions and I will be ignoring branches and loops for most of the talk. Uh, so this basically means it's a sequence of instructions, right? But this is what you see there. There are some states and some transitions between them. Now, if you put a second program in parallel, um, you get something like this, for example, right? So here you have two programs, P and Q. One is running horizontally, the other one is running vertically. And you see the green, it's an execution. So first P, first P is executing, then Q is taking two steps, then P is taking a step and so on. Uh, here's another, well, actually, no, it's not an execution. Right? So here we have a problem. Um, this one goes back in time. Programs generally don't go much back in time. So this is something which we would not permit as an execution. Um, but now you could also think that, uh, well, maybe those two programs, they're actually not executing a lockstep. Right? So here you would have uh, what we might call a geometric execution where uh, let's say Q is starting by being faster than P, they're executing in parallel, right? So, so we start at the initial state and immediately P and Q, they start working, both of them. In the beginning, Q is slightly faster than P and in the end, P is slightly faster than Q. So they get to, uh, to, to, to the finishing point at some point. Now, um, there are also thing, things which are not geometric execution, right? So you saw again, uh, you saw already going back in time is something we don't permit. So this one goes again back in time, right? Here, uh, during this execution, if it would be one, then P would go back in time at some point. So we have now an idea of, of processes or programs which can run in parallel, and we know what are executions and what are not executions. Uh, next thing we could do would be to add a mutual exclusion. So now you see here, there is a hole in my state space. Um, why is there a hole in my state space? And why is there a hole in my microphone? Uh, is it okay for the sound like this? Okay, fine. So let me uh, leave the mic there. Um, so uh, you see now there, are, there is a shared variable between those two programs, right? There is a variable X. One program sets, uh, tries to set it to three, the other one to two. Uh, and of course, they cannot have right access to the variable both at, this, at the same time. So we have a hole. We have a place 
which is where there is mutual exclusion, where not both programs can execute at the same time. And I've marked this uh, gray here. So this means that any parallel executions of the two programs have to go around the hole. Right? So you see now here two blue executions where uh, P is getting the lock on the variable first. You see two green execution where Q is getting the lock first and one red one, which is not an execution. So everything which is red is not an execution. Um, and why it's not an execution? Well, because it would go through a state where both programs would have write access to the variable. And uh, we, don't, we don't want this, right? Um, so you will also notice that the results of the blue and the green uh, executions are different. So the blue executions, P gets access to the variables first, but then afterwards Q will overwrite it. And for the green one, P will put the last value into the variable. So it has different values at the end of the execution. Now, we can add uh, more interesting holes to this thing. So uh, those are now, uh, this is the slide that you saw uh, during most of Eric's and uh, Philip's introduction. Um, those are semaphores a la Dijkstra. So I'm abstracting away uh, variables and values here, right? I'm just setting, I have an, I can acquire a lock and I can release a lock. Um, so here I have two locks. I have a lock A and a lock B and the process P will first acquire the lock for A and then the one for B and then release the one for B and then release the one uh, for A. And process Q is doing the inverse. Now, um, the lock on uh, the, the semaphore for A um, gives rise to, uh, sorry, gives rise to, 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 to this red hole, right? Semaphore for B gives rise to the other red hole. And now uh, once, uh, you combine them, you get this big gray hole. And uh, now I don't know how to switch slides on the on Zoom anymore. Haha. -ha. Yes. Okay. Okay. It just. I'm, I'm switching them. Uh, you are switching them now. Ooh, fancy, fancy, fancy. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so those two uh, semaphores now com conspire to get us uh, a hole in our process space with concave corners. Right. So you saw that. Uh, one was, uh, semaphore B was getting us this whole shape, semaphore A was getting us this whole shape, and now they conspire to get this uh, thing. And now you can do something more interesting because now you have some executions which will be deadlocked. If you have a place in your process space, if an execution ever gets there, then it will deadlock. So um, let's say algebraically or in terms of programs, this means that um, Q, the, the first process acquires the lock on A, the second process acquires the lock on B, and now they are stuck because P needs the lock on B to execute and Q needs the lock on A to execute. Um, so uh, all those things, um, it's something which, uh, it, it's things which, which were known to Dijkstra in the 70s, and people did a lot of work on um, how to ensure that programs are deadlock free and so on. Um, but I'm not going to get into this. I'm just uh, going to tell you something more interesting geometry you can see here. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the lower left corner, which is yellow, this is what uh, you might call the doomed region, right? Because as soon as an execution will enter this yellow region, it must go into the deadlock. There is no way out because our executions are increasing in time. If I enter the yellow uh, block, I am doomed to get into the deadlock. Similarly, uh, the other yellow block on the top right is unreachable, right? No execution will ever be able to get there. Um, you can uh, hide uh, all your crypto money in there. No program will ever be able to go into that. Okay, so uh, summing up, what we have seen is that you can have a geometric view on, uh, on programs and executions where programs are topological spaces executions are paths through spaces and two executions are equivalent if their paths are homotopic. So I did not talk about this yet, but you can see it here across the whole, right? We said, we saw that the two blue instructions give the same value. The two green uh, executions give the same value. They are not equivalent, the green and the blue, but the green are equivalent one with each other and the blue are equivalent. And this is because they're, I mean, so, so you can see the two paths, the two blue paths are homotopic, 
the two green parts are homotopic, but there is no homotopy between blue and green. Fine, except I only told you half of the story because what we have forgotten here is the direction of time. Right, so you saw there are some executions which are forbidden. So actually executions are not just parts, they are directed parts. Programs are not just spaces, but directed spaces. We need notions of directions of time in our setting. Um, and then uh, just for good measure, we are adding two other dice here. So two executions are equivalent if they are directed parts are dihomotopic. Um, so this is the, uh, the geometric setting um, which people have discovered, um, let's say some 25 years ago, something like this. Um, so let me give you a quick introduction to those things uh, which are in red here. So we need to talk about directed topological spaces. Uh, what is a directed topological space? Um, it's, uh, for example, one way of putting a direction into a space is by putting a partial order on it, right? So you might say, okay, I'm taking a topological space and I'm putting a partial order on my points. And then I have a compatibility condition that I want the partial order to be closed in the, in the product topology. This is called a PO space. Those things are also uh, rather old. Um, it allows you to model lots of interesting things. For example, everything I have shown you, except that it does not allow you to model any loops, right? Because now you have a, you have a partial order on your points in your space. So if you can go, uh, from A to B, well, you can never go back from B to A, unless A and B are the same point, of course, but uh, uh, so, so you will not be able to have any loops in your process. So in order to have loops, you need to localize this notion. Um, and what you get are locally partially ordered spaces. So this is something which is reasonably new. Um, so a locally partially ordered space is a space together with a relation in which every point has an open neighborhood such that the relation is a partial order in this neighborhood. So this means you can, for example, model loops now, or you can model toruses, right? So on a torus, you can introduce a local partial order. Um, your, your, your neighborhoods can be quite big, right? But the, the essential is that every point has a neighborhood in which it looks like uh, time is a partial order. Now, uh, this is a nice model, and we're going to see it again later in this talk. Um, there is another model which uh, came a bit later historically, um, because instead of trying to order your points, you can also talk directly about this, the paths you want in your space. So this is very convenient. Uh, so a directed space or a D space is simply a topological space together with a specified set of paths. So you take your topological space and you say, I want those parts and I don't want those parts. So how do you do this precisely? Well, you need your set of directed paths to be such that all constant paths are directed. When you concatenate two directed paths, you want the results still to be directed. And uh, when you reparameterize a path, which is directed, you also want it to be directed evidently because of the geometric picture we have in mind, right? Uh, yes. Uh, well, it means uh, you have a path in your space and you can either go uh, at the constant speed through your path or you can go very fast in the beginning and then slower in the end. This is just a reparameterization of, um, of the way it traverses your path. I see. That's yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so reparameterizations and also restrictions of directed paths should be restricted, right? Those are the actions we would have on executions that if you have an execution and you take only part of it, it's also still an execution, for example. Um, and now uh, there, is an, I mean, there are obvious inclusions of PO spaces into local PO spaces into these spaces. It's not so obvious that both inclusions are not full as functors. Um, the properties are that, uh, so we've said this already, partially ordered spaces don't have loops, they are loop free. Um, locally partially order spaces, they have loops, but they don't admit vortices. So this means that, well, I mean, I told you, every point has an open neighborhood where the thing is a partial order, right? So every point has an open neighborhood where there are no loops. Uh, these spaces admit all kinds of crazy um, things. 
Um, so they are very nice categorically. Uh, they are very nice because they axiomatize directly the objects of interest, but they are not always easy to work with because they admit vortices and all kinds of other crazy things. Okay, um, this is almost the end of the first part of this talk. Um, so the last thing we need to talk about are directed paths in directed spaces or executions. So in order to define those properly, you need to say, what is the directed interval? Um, so the directed interval is, well, just the usual interval with the usual partial order, the usual total order on it, or equivalently, the D space, which is all weakly increasing paths as directed paths through the interval. So that's just another way of, I mean, those two things are, are completely trivially equivalent, right? And now a die path in the space is a morphism from the directed interval into that space. So this was this was very simple. That's that's a very nice uh, notion. And uh, now you notice that uh, for for spaces which we saw just before, um, the die paths are precisely the uh, well the d paths which we which we specified uh, that those are the executions that we want. And now uh, we also needed the notion of homotopy. So here. I've put one notion, there are other notions of homotopy which uh, people have been using, but a dihomotopy is now a mapping from the undirected interval times the directed interval into this space, so that um, it goes through directed paths, but in the second component it's not necessarily directed, right? So it's a continuous function from the box into the space. Um, the beginning and the end are somehow constrained, so they might be constrained to one point only or to some subsets, and it goes through directed paths. Um, Wait, I'm sorry. Yes. A question. There is a question. Yes. Is there a definition for all this? For an example, we say they claim here three rather than single. I am sorry, I did not understand the question. Is there a definition for this? And all them example. The Hawaiian earrings, the Hawaiian earrings, there is a question. Um, yes, Hawaiian earrings are examples of, uh, of a vortex. Yes, yes. Um, and I'm sorry, I do not have time to go uh, into definitions and technicalities, but exactly, if you look at Hawaiian earrings, those give you a, a vortex and the point where they are all connect connected. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay, so those was it. Uh, um, so let, let's just sum up again. We've said a program is a directed topological space. Uh, we've seen several models of those directed uh, topological spaces. Other models exist. Uh, so I, I can only go into those uh, three here. We've seen that an execution is a directed path through a directed space. And that two executions are equivalent if and only if their die paths are bihomotopic. So this opens up a setting where you can reason about properties of programs by looking at them as directed topological spaces. Now let's get into the second part of the talk. And by now uh, I should have finished my talk already, but I will take some 10 minutes more. Um, because now when you go to computer scientists and you tell them programs are topological spaces, uh, they shake your head at you. Um, for a computer scientist, a program is a transition system. So uh, any theoretical computer scientist will tell you a program consists of states and transitions between the states. Right? This is actually what we saw, right? Uh, when I first saw, showed you the first program, the one which is on the in the bottom here, right? Uh, I mean, this those has it has states and it has transitions between states. So for a computer scientist, the program, the product of two programs is also a transition system, which you see here. So here you see the same two processes we had before. Uh, and now you have product states and you can do your executions through the product of those two things. So for example, again, here you have a green execution and the blue execution, much as the first executions we saw in the first part of the talk. Um, so that's all nice and fine. And, and you, can, you can get very far with it. Theoretical computer science has gotten very far with those uh, things, except we have lost the information on the forbidden square now, right? 
if you look closely uh, you see well okay all my executions are now going along the edges um, and i've lost the information that there is one particular part of the state space where there is mutual exclusion uh, actually what i've lost is more the the other side of the information that in all the other parts of my state space there is no mutual exclusion right? so i'm i'm uh, restricting myself to look only at executions which go either up and right here so they can never execute together anymore in this transition system like model right this is what is called interleaving concurrency um, and if you do interleaving concurrency the, the the geometric models are useless for you um, what we want to do is um, to have information on uh, mutexes or non mutexes in our program um, which is why we enrich transition systems with information on concurrency so um, this will change now so now here you see um, an empty square which is where the mutex was before which now indicates that uh, the two processes cannot go through this square and all the other squares are filled in all the non mutexes I have indicated by filling in the squares by putting an object there, a two dimensional object, and now executions can go through those two dimensional objects. So you see, for example, the new green execution, it first has Q taking two steps, and then P and Q are taking each one step together at the same time. There is non interleaving concurrency in this model. And now once you have done this for two dimensions, you can imagine how you can do it for three dimensions and four dimensions and so on. Um, I will not have any higher dimensional examples. Um, so this introduces a notion of, uh, of higher dimensional automaton. Um, so an automaton is a transition system. Now we have an automaton with higher dimensional structure, which indicates non interleaving concurrency. This is the precise definition. A higher dimensional automaton is a pre-cubical set with uh, a labeling and specified start and accept cells. Um, what is a pre-cubical set? It's a set of, of uh, squares and cubes of different dimensions which are connected. Right? So here you see it's a graded set. So the N in the XN indicates the dimension. Um, and then you have face maps, which for every N-dimensional cell tell you some lower faces and some upper faces. So for example, here you see a two dimensional cell, which has two lower faces, which are called delta one zero and delta two zero. It has two upper faces, and then those faces are connected, right? So you have, a, uh, you have an axiom called the pre-cubical identity, which tells you, for example, that, well, the lower face of the, um, um, of the horizontal lower face is the same thing as the lower face of the vertical lower face. Uh, so this might look complicated combinatorically, but ge the geometric picture is very easy. And now a higher dimensional automaton is simply such a thing together with a labeling. So you know what is happening on the different transitions and squares and so on. And uh, some parts of the automaton which tell you this is where we start and this is where we end. So here are some examples of those things. It's always easier to see things in examples. This is a higher dimensional automaton, which is modeling that I am doing two commands, two instructions called A and B, one after the other. Um, and they are all in parallel with the third instruction, which is called C. Right? So I'm starting at the beginning, and I'm starting by doing A. Well, I'm able to do A and C in parallel in the beginning. Then sometime later, A will finish and B will start, all the while C may still be running. Right? So this is A, B in parallel with C. Another example, slightly more complicated. So here you can run again A, B in parallel with C, but then while B is running, you can also finish the C and start a D, right? So altogether, this gets you a, a precedent structure, which, uh, which is here in the bottom, right? This is saying that, well, A is coming before B, C is coming before D, this is the vertical structure, but also A is coming before D. Right? Because before you can go into the D square, uh, you need to finish A because there is this concave uh, corner. Another nice example, uh, this time with a loop. 
Um, so here you see that you can do an A vertically, all the while you can run around in your loop and do B and C one after the other as much as you want. Right, so you have B followed by C, potentially followed by another BC, potentially followed by another BC, all while A is running. So this is A in parallel with BC star for people who, uh, who like this algebraic notation of things. Okay, um, now the nice thing is that uh, pre-cubical sets and higher dimensional automata are objects of algebraic topology and they are connected to spaces via geometric realization. So if I take a pre-cubical set, I can define a D space, which is the geometric realization of it, where I simply take geometric uh, cubes for all the combinatorial cubes I have in my automaton. So I start with a higher dimensional automaton with all kinds of different cells. For every cell, I take a geometric cube. This is the uh, I um, power N, you see there. Um, and I quotient all my construction by uh, transporting the face maps from the combinatorial to the geometric setting. So basically, this means that the geometric realization of a precubic set looks like the examples you just saw. Right? What you saw were not precubic sets, but geometric realizations. And why is this the case? Well, because we like to see pictures, right? And the picture is a geometric realization. Um, for people who like those words, this is just the usual Cohen definition. Um, it's left adjoint to a singular precubic set functor. Uh, and actually, you can show that this is not just a D space, but it's an LPO space. So geometric realizations of precubic sets do not have vortices. I believe uh, in some talks, uh, this will be mentioned uh, again during this conference. Okay, so now uh, we know how to have pictures of precubic sets. Um, the next thing you want to do is to transport your notions of execution. So here you see a die path in the geometric realization of a precubical set. And the nice thing is that, uh, well, you can again transport it. So, so this is a geometric notion inside the geometric realization, and we will now transport it back to the combinatorial setting. So if you see, look at this orange die path, uh, you take all the cells which are touched by the die path, so those are the yellow ones uh, here, right? You have some, some two-dimensional cells, some one-dimensional cell, you have the zero-dimensional cell, and now you can organize them into a sequence. This is called the carrier sequence of this uh, die path, or more simply just the track of it. Um, so you can organize it into a sequence so that uh, each cell in the sequence is either an upper phase of what came before, or it's the lower phase of what comes after, right? So either you go from uh, something uh, n-dimensional to something less than n-dimensional in time, or you go from something less than n-dimensional to n-dimensional. Um, so this thing, uh, sequences like this are called tracks. Um, we've seen that any die path gives rise to a track. It's also true that any track gives rise to a die path. Um, it's non-unique, but you can, for example, just connect the, the, the center points of all your, um, your, your cells in the track. Um, also, if two die paths give rise to the same track, then they are dihomotopic automatically. And even more is true because uh, you can also transport the notion of directed homotopy back to the combinatorial setting, um, which is now called track homotopy. Um, so track homotopy is generated by local replacements. Here you see an example where you have a track uh, which is, well, it's going from a zero dimensional cell to a one into a zero dimensional cell into a one dimensional cell into a two dimensional cell and then back into a fa another, an upper phase of this. And now you can replace the, um, the horizontal one dimensional cell by a vertical one dimensional cell. Intuitively, this is, is a notion which preserves homotopy. Um, uh, then you can preserve, you can replace the right um, one cell by a horizontal one cell. This is the second transformation. 
and now we can remove the two cell and replace it by a one cell right so intuitively you have now uh, transformed the directed path which was going kind of uh, right and up uh, into something which is going straight up and then straight right um, so there is a notion of homotopy of trucks and i'm sorry i don't have time to uh, to talk much more about this but in any case um uh oh maybe i should have said uh so the properties are that die parts are dihomotopic if and only if their trucks are homotopic and the trucks are homotopic if and only if the corresponding die parts are homotopic are dihomotopic which then in um in induces the property that any two die paths which are running through the two pack trucks will automatically be dihomotopic. So summing up, we've seen a combinatorial model for directed spaces, which are pre-cubic sets of higher dimensional commata. Uh, these are also a natural extension of transition systems that are actually being used in computer science. They are closely linked to directed spaces via the geometric realization functor, um, where executions correspond to die paths on the geometric side and to trucks on the combinatorial side. And equivalence of execution corresponds to truck homotopy and then to die path uh, die homotopy. And uh, this is the time where I wanted to talk about invariance, but uh, Erika, do I have time for this? Okay, okay, good. So I will spend another 10 minutes on invariance. So uh, now that I've introduced the, uh, the, the geometric, the topological setting for reasoning about programs, the question is, what can you do with it? Um, and that's, that's a very good question, uh, which um, computer scientists are asking us all the time, actually. Um, and one thing you can do is to compute invariance. So uh, you could say I have a program, which is uh, this uh, large uh, combinatorial or geometric object, and I can try to compute topological invariance of it and see what they tell me about um, the semantic of uh, the, the executions of this program. So one invariant I could compute would be the fundamental group. For example, right? So, so that's always the first environment you learn about in, in algebraic topology is fundamental groups. Um, except that for directed spaces, the fundamental group doesn't tell you a lot. Um, and the reason is that um, the reason that we are using fundamental groups in the first place is because in topological spaces, all information can be reduced to loops, right? If I want to know how many ways do I have to go from A to B. Well, I go back from B to A and I check how many ways do I have to go from A to A and that's enough. Um, so all information in a topological space can be reduced to loops and to base points. Um, in directed spaces, this is not the case. So instead of looking at fundamental groups, we need to look at fundamental categories. So what is the fundamental category of a directed space? It has as objects all the points on the slate. And as morphisms, dihomotopy classes of die parts, right? So my morphisms from P to Q, are they called X to Y? No, they're called, well, from X to Y will be all dihomotopy classes of die parts I can use to go from X to Y. So there might be only one. Uh, we saw this in, 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 there will be some examples, right? All the examples we have seen, there are either one or two or zero dihomotopy classes to go from uh, from one point to another. Um, this is inspired by the use of uh, fundamental groupoids of topological spaces, because there are people who were doing this in topology before we did it in directed topology. Um, you can also, once you have the fundamental category, you can try to see, well, what are two dimensional dihomotopy invariants, what are, what are higher dimensional uh, dihomotopy invariance, and uh, the answer is this is work in progress. Uh, this has been work in progress for a long time, uh, and it's 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 not clear how to do this. Um, another thing you can do is okay. So the, let's say we have now the fundamental category, uh, but it's huge, right? I said you, I told you the objects of the fundamental category are all the points in the space, so it's an uncountable object. The fundamental group is nice because it's a very small thing right and now we, we are we are 
confronted here with, with, a, with an invariant, which we would like to use, but it's huge. So what can you do with it? Well, you can notice that some points are equivalent. So for example, in this example, um, uh, you can, um, um, group points by choices you make, right? So, so, so uh, um, this is called the component category of the fundamental category. The precise definition is on the left. So um, you will introduce a notion of, of weak isomorphism or future weak isomorphism or past weak isomorphism. Um, and you quotient your fundamental category by this equivalence. Um, this is e more easily to understand, more easy to understand by the picture. So, if you look, for example, at the uh, the bottom left box delineated by the blue um, lines, uh, you see that uh, in this box you still have the choice whether you want to traverse the whole um, to the left or to the bottom, right? Whether you want to go right or you want to go up. But as soon as you have crossed one of the blue lines, you don't have this choice anymore, right? So you are making a choice when crossing the, uh, the, the first blue line uh, out of your initial state. There's a question. So two questions. When yes. you said it was huge and measured the word uncountable, yes. do you mean that in the sense of not being a countable set? Uh, I mean uncountable. In general, our spaces are uncountable, so the fundamental category has uncountably many objects. Um, and I don't see how I have a choice if I go up two steps on the left. So yes. how, how can I? I am coming to this. So the second, uh, um, let's just talk about the second horizontal line. It's not about making choices, but about um, losing choices. Because when you are below the second horizontal line, so uh, even though people on Zoom will maybe not see it, when you are here, you still can make the choice to go right into the deadlock, which you lose when you cross the line. Right? So you don't make, well, you don't make a choice by crossing the line, but you lose a possible choice that you could make. Right? So it's not just about choices, but also about possible choices. Um, the same thing with the green lines there, right? So here it's possible choices you could have made in the past, right? Uh, the, the, the top green box is one way you could arrive from the right or from the bottom. Um, but below the green line or left of the first green line, uh, you know that you have made some choices in the past which have brought you there. This is why they are not, um, those ones are not past equivalent. The blue ones in the bottom are not future equivalent. The red ones and the, the, the green ones in the top um, make a separation between um, states which are past equivalent in your component category. Uh, so altogether, this gets you a finite and very compact representation of your fundamental category. Another idea is to tell yourself that um, uh, well, the, the, the fundamental category is all nice and good, but what we are really interested in is, uh, is, uh, is paths, is directed paths in execution spaces. Right? Um, so maybe uh, we should find a way to work directly with directed paths. Uh, so this is something which people have been doing um, because you can equip uh, your die paths with the compact open topology, and then you get another topological space. And once you have a usual standard topological space, you can uh, throw all your hammers at the edit, uh, which you have in your, in, your, in your disposal. So you can try to do uh, uh, homotopy, you can try to do homology uh, of path spaces, right? So you go one dimension up um, and you consider path spaces. And you can show, for example, um, that uh, path spaces are homotopy equivalent to prot centrical complexes. Uh, you can pose them as prot permuter heterocomplexes. complexes. You can pose them as nerves of the cube chain category. All this goes through um, path, die paths modulo reparametrizations, which are called traces. Uh, so people usually consider traces instead of paths. People usually consider 
so-called tail paths, uh, which have special property. People usually consider paths which never stop. You can you can do a lot lots of uh, of things to simplify your life. Um, this is a very rich uh, area of research, and I'm sure we will hear about it uh, again even today. Um, what you can also do with your path spaces is directed homology. Uh, and I'm having the shrug emoji here because the directed homology is something that people have been thinking about for a long time. So, uh, personal story I started my career in directed topology by thinking about directed homology back in 2002. Um, I might even have a paper about it somewhere, um, but it never went very far because uh, when you think about homology, I mean, uh, you are not only interested in defining uh, a nice invariant of your spaces but something you can actually use for calculations right so you have you have two purposes with homology is to define a good invariant which is somehow faithful to what you want to look at but you also want to want to use it for calculations you want to uh, to i don't know to do uh, long exact sequences short exact sequences uh, uh, you want to actually get something out of your homology and uh, this has been uh, the big problem i think um, so here is one approach, one much more recent approach to uh, directed homology, which is called natural homology. Um, we already talked about uh, path spaces and trace spaces. So this is the same idea again. I'm taking my path spaces and then doing homology of path spaces. Right. So um, and let's just go to traces directly. Trace spaces formed from topological categories where the objects are points and the morphisms are traces between points, because I'm looking at those up to reparameterization. This gives me associativity on the nose, so I have actually a category. And now, um, for every two points, I can define a homology, which is the homology of the trace space between two points. Right? So the end homology of x between x and y is the n minus first homology of the trace space from x to y. Um, and the nice thing is that those combine into a natural system of abelian groups, right? So for every two points, you have a path space, which gives you a homology. And you have mappings between them, because uh, when you look at traces from one point to another, you can extend them to the left and to the right. So this is depicted here on the right. You have a trace beta from x to y, which you can extend by prepending alpha or by uh, suffixing uh, gamma. I don't think there is a word for postpending. Um, so this gets you a new trace from w to z, which is alpha combined, uh, concatenated with beta, concatenated with gamma. So you have um, traces and you have extensions. And formally, those define the factorization category. So the objects in your factorization category are now traces, and the morphisms are extensions of traces. And now you can transport all this to homology uh, in, in, in one go, right? You take, you take a, a functor which maps traces to the n minus first homology group of the trace space from x to y, and maps extensions to mappings in homology. So this gets you what is called a natural system of homology. And here is an example, or two examples, actually. So uh, you have a very simple interval. You have uh, two intervals which are connected at the, at the beginning and in the end. And this is what their natural homology looks like. We will not be able to understand this in the minus four minutes that we have left. Uh, but the point is that, OK, it's huge again, right? Because now you're not just looking at points. You're looking at traces. Those are your objects. Um, but in a sense, it's manageable because you get a lot of, of similarities between things, and then you can uh, you can compactify natural homology. And um, I think, um, in general, the uh, opinions are still divided as to um, whether this is really the good notion of the directed homology. But um, I think you might call it a good candidate. Um, let's finish this. So we've seen uh, that programs are directed topological spaces. We've seen that programs are also pre-cubical sets or higher dimensional automata. 
uh, we've so looked at some some invariance of those uh, things and um, what uh, you might see during some parts of, of this week's uh, get code is that people are also looking at, at languages so so this is current work that i know that people are doing in the community people are looking at languages of those combinatorial uh, things uh, people are using um, discrete morse theory and cube chains to look at path spaces and trace spaces uh, people are thinking about model categories for directed topologies uh, directed topology and connections with persistent homology there will be a talk on friday uh, people are looking at higher dimensional linear algebra, and there are lots of things which I've been forgetting here, and I apologize uh, in advance. Um, and the last two slides are just a very incomplete bibliography of this, and uh, I am sorry to be so late, but I thank you for your attention. Uh, just to speak up. Okay. <laughs> So uh, thanks about Uli. Are there any questions in the room or over the room? No questions? Yes, please. Where does the uncountability come from? I didn't see any concepts and computers. Um, well, the, I mean, the answer uh, will surprise you by its simplicity because uh, our usual state spaces are some, some products of real numbers, right? Uh, so you saw a process which is real numbers and another one which is also the real numbers so, and so then that was n squared that was r squared that was yes that was r squared yes Thank you. yeah Thank you. um the factorization category reminds me a lot of the arrow categories categories mm -hmm. so i'm wondering can you um just the Yes, the factorization category, you can define it for any category. Um, this is uh, old work by Bauer and uh, Dershing. Um, yes, yeah. it's the twisted arrow category. It's, it is the twisted arrow category, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just wanted to ask if the homology figures they kept were category, um, like the anything like possible or like the one Please. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting question. Uh, as only mentioned, um, these natural systems they were uh, used by Bauss and Virching to give a meaning to uh, homology of categories, of small categories. But as coefficient systems, uh, as a local sort of coefficient systems, general ones. So it's pretty different here because we, I mean, it's the actual homology, but not the coefficients that we're looking at. So, so I don't really know. We haven't applied to categories, but that's indeed a, a very interesting thing to look at. Um, yeah. And that's something we want to pursue also with higher invariance, with uh, on the rewriting sort of applications, it's a big, big interest to us. There's been also some extensions with uh, Cameron and, and Philippe Malbos on uh, on extra sort of homological operations on, on these, um, these natural systems, because you have a concatenation 